I'd like to introduce our IDHRC chair, Jessica Bullock, and the interim director for Iowa Homeland Security and Emergency Management, John Benson, who have the honor of announcing the individual 2019 Don Hampton Memorial Service Award. I'll hand it over to John Benson. Thank you, Lori. Good morning, everyone. Um, first, uh, my completely my honor to be on uh, line with you folks today. Um, really exciting that uh, I actually get to present the Don Hampton Award. Um, big. That's been, as most of you know, I don't have, I'm preaching to the choir on this a little bit. Volunteerism in, in time of a disaster is really something that props up the entire response to disasters. Um, as much as people want to say government can do it all by themselves, we know that not to be accurate. Um, it's the volunteers out there that really make the difference. Um, Laurie asked me just real quick to kind of uh, give everybody a little bit of background on Don. I think I had the pleasure of meeting Don a, a couple of different times um, through his work with the IDHRC. Don is one of those, or was one of those foundational people upon which uh, the process of disaster volunteerism really stands upon. Um, he was one of those founding members of the IDHRC when it first got started and obviously held a couple of different leadership positions on both the board of directors and also with uh, functioning as the treasurer for the IDHRC. Um, but he didn't confine his work, you know, solely to just in the state of Iowa. He did do a lot of work outside of the state. Um, you know, when you look at like something like the Superstorm Sandy that happened and the fact that, you know, he willingly took off to the East Coast to help volunteer out there, recognized the shortage and said, I can help. Um, that's really that's really what volunteerism is. So it's really pretty awesome. You look at, you know, not only was he involved with the IDHRC, but he was recognized nationally, too, as the National VOAD of, uh, Volunteer of the Year in 2013, as well as receiving the Presidential Volunteer Service Award in that same year. So um, Don set a high standard of which we all try to achieve when we talk about doing volunteer work. Um, and this year, or I can't say this year, uh, in 2019, um, we did, we saw a lot of good volunteering going on and um, Greg Smith and Karen Hyde actually put forth uh, a nominee um, that is going to receive this award that um, Elaine Haugen and I was I was reading through the the nomination forms that came forward from uh, for Elaine from Karen and Greg and I, I, I the thing that caught my eye in there was I was just looking at the, the, all of the work she has done I just I'm not going to read the entire thing to you but I just want to give you this list so she's a member of the uh, Iowa Dis disaster behavioral behavioral health response team and I'll talk about that a little more in a second because that's really important to myself um, the United Methodist Committee on Relief, Volunteers for the United Methodist and Volunteers for the United Methodist Church, Evangelical Lutherans Rebuild Synod, Project Fest Start, and the Polk County Conservation Board. Um, she does more on those groups than I think I've ever done in my entire life. So just from a sheer work point, um, Elaine is, is, is certainly awesome. But the one thing I did want to talk about, and this is I this is vitally important to me and my work that I've done here with the department is specifically with the Iowa disaster behavioral health response team. Um, one of the things that I think we all recognize when we do get into the middle of a disaster is uh, not only the mental impact that it has for the folks that are being impacted to the disaster, but the mental impact it has on the folks that are responding and helping out in that disaster. Um, you will see my, my, my view on this is you will see the uh, mental scars of a disaster being in place long after the disaster has left. If it's a flood, if the flood is gone and the tornado is gone, buildings are repaired. Those mental scars can linger for years. And the ID BART has been a very important team member in that. Um, so um, I was very pleased to see that Elaine was nominated for this. Um, she's done outstanding work. And so it is, this is actually one of the first get things I get to do as the interim director. I just became the interim director on Friday. And honestly, this is probably one of the most important things I'll do this year. So it is with great honor um, that I bestow upon uh, Elaine Haugen, the Don Hampton Memorial Award for volunteerism in Iowa. Elaine, congratulations. Thank you. Now I get to respond, they said. Um, I thought the best thing to do was to try to condense all of the all of those thousands and thousands of survivors, victims, whatever title you want to give them that lived through the floods. And um, 
one of the easiest ways for me to do that is to paint a picture in your mind of one, just one of the people I worked with. I met her several days after she was evacuated in the middle of the night at 3 a.m. They knocked on her door. She's 95 years old. She has lived in her home for over 75 years, never flooded before. They knocked on her door. They said, you have 10 minutes to gather whatever you want to bring out of here. She said, you know, I grabbed and I brought my important papers and I brought my dogs. And that's about all I could think about. When I meet a new volunteer or a new volunteer, a new person to work with, I'm the volunteer. I say to them, what is one thing, just one thing I can do today to alleviate your stress, to make you feel better mentally, physically, emotionally, and yes, spiritually, because I do not do this work because it's my choice. I know who the boss is. And he has kept me busy for well over 50 years, and we're not done yet. Um, I work for Jesus. And if that upsets anyone, I'm sorry, but not for very long, because I know the boss. Anyway, back to my lady. She said to me, the one thing, one thing, she said, I've lost my home. I'm going to lose my dog. One thing. Oh, I know, she said. Remember, they took me at 3 a.m. and put me in one of those boats with the big helicopter on the back end. I'm 95 years old. She said, honey, when I got to that place they took me off it, I needed clean underwear. And I still do, by golly, she said, because everybody brought things for children. We need underwear. I said, done. I don't know how to explain when these things happen. As I said, I work for the boss. I had the night before gone and bought myself some new underwear. Now, I'm a little short, fat lady, and she's a big, tall, dignified lady. She said, I'll take them. So I went out to my car, and we bonded. Then I went back, and I said, something you said made me need to know more. You said you lost your home, but you also said tomorrow you're losing your best friend. Tell me about that. She said, I've had her for 15 years. She has cancer. We had an appointment to have her put down. And I don't remember the dog's name. But she said, I have no money now. I have to rent a place to live. I have no money to pay the vet to put my dog to sleep. She said, so my neighbor has offered to shoot her. When she said it, I could see the grief on her face. I said, you coming for breakfast tomorrow again? You see, that was one of the gifts as mental health workers. People came to a general site every day. So we had access to them one, two or three times a day. Um, that's just a little side bear that made our lives. But anyway, I said to her, let me have a little time to see if I can't find someone who has money to put your doggy to sleep. And I said to my friend Ernie, who was my coworker that day, Ernie, you got one of them smartphones? Go figure out who, who can put a dog to sleep without charging. And I said, out of my reach of my many walks through disasters, into my brain popped this muddy pause. I don't know where I met muddy paws. Ernie went in, looked him up within a half an hour while the lady ate her, her breakfast. We had an organization that would euthanize the dog and would work with the local vet to have that happen and would give her an urn of ashes because she had wanted to have some to take to her grave with her. So back to the story. She not only, um, we talked about the dog, but she talked about what she was going to do next. I was stationed at Pacific Junction. If you don't know that little city's history, they now hold the distinction of having been completely submerged for 38 days. On the 37th morning, I said to those eating breakfast, if you go out there today and you see a large, large boat and a man named Noah 
for heaven's sakes, will you come back and get me? And they got a good giggle out of that. But Noah wasn't there. Most of them lost their homes. I was with this lady. She asked me to go with her when her family came to take her to see if there was anything that could be salvaged or saved. So we walked together up onto the porch, which we had a big son. She had big men in her family on either side of her because it didn't look like the boards would even hold us up to get to the door. She opened the door and the smell that came out of there was horrendous. She shut the door, she turned around and said to her children and grandchildren, remember how you've been on me for years to get rid of that junk I'd accumulated my whole life? I did it. She said, it's gone. Now, instead of coming out here again, I suggest that we go to that new senior building they're building and see if they've got an apartment and we'll get me a place to live instead of standing out here in this mud and muck. I was overwhelmed with her ability to be that strong in the middle of a huge crisis in her life. She impacted me and I impacted her. And I pray that just this one little story helps you to understand a little bit more of what it is to walk with the victims, the survivors, the families, the other volunteers, whoever it is. Don't forget, just ask them if there's just one thing you can do. And chances are you'll be able to do it. And I, I told Lori, that I was going to use this opportunity to recruit more volunteers, and I jolly well will, because I'll tell you a story from the Bible about Lazarus, and it goes really quickly. Mary and Martha were Lazarus' sisters. Jesus was coming to stay at their house, and that created quite a hubbub. In the middle of it, Lazarus somehow managed to die. So they went and got Jesus and said, can you fix him? Jesus used Lazarus to deliver a message to those people. He still uses Lazarus today because here's what I say to you. You can do what I do. You can do more than I do. It's not about me, but here's the clink. Lazarus was flat out dead. I guarantee you, if you're having a reaction to what I'm saying, you ain't dead. We can use you, get up. There are thousands of opportunities. We each have gifts to give. And someday, maybe you'll be a 2019 volunteer of the year. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you so much, Elaine, and congratulations on this well-deserved honor and your story your um, your call to all of us to see what's that one thing we can do is a really great transition to um, a moment for us on our self-care side of things. 